Hi, my name is Monty Johnson. I teach philosophy at the University of California, San Diego. And this is a lecture on Aristotle's Politics, Book 8, which is about the education of the citizens in the perfect state. I'm using the translation of the Politics by Benjamin Jowett, Oxford 1921, which is in the public domain. Here's an outline of the book overall. In chapter one, Aristotle discusses the importance of education to the constitution, to any constitution. In chapter two, he discusses and distinguishes between liberal or free education and illiberal education. In chapter three, he discusses the customary branches of education and their purposes. In chapter four, he discusses the purpose of physical education specifically, that is gymnastic exercises. And in chapters five to seven, he discusses the purpose of musical education, both performance and appreciation. So the first chapter, about the importance of education to the Constitution. Aristotle couldn't be stronger or more direct. Quote, none will doubt that the legislator should direct his attention above all to the education of youth, for the neglect of education does harm to the Constitution. And he fills this out specifically by saying that, quote, the citizen should be molded to suit the form of government under which he lives, for each government has a peculiar character which originally formed and which continues to preserve it. The character of a democracy creates democracy, and the character of oligarchy creates oligarchy. And always the better the character, the better the government. So if anyone cares about creating or sustaining a democracy, you better care about education and educating people to preserve that democracy and any other constitutional type, including Aristotle's best regime. Now, notice that nowhere in the politics does Aristotle discuss or even mention any benefit of education for individuals specifically, nor does he discuss whether certain individuals or even the whole population might benefit from a different kind of education than the one that is supported by the state. For example, Perhaps I live in a democracy, but I individually would benefit more from an aristocratic kind of education. Aristotle says nothing about that situation. Or perhaps some people would benefit more from a democratic style education, even though they exist in an oligarchy. None of that is of concern to Aristotle here. His perspective is entirely from the side of importance of education in supporting and sustaining the constitution. Most states, he acknowledges, fail to support their constitutions because they neglect education. But it's as if individual motives for education, like getting a job or even intellectual enjoyment, are irrelevant to the political theory of education, which is only concerned with how in education inculcates in its citizens the kinds of virtues that that constitution holds to the good life to consist in. Now, Aristotle argues that education should be public. Here's his argument. First, for the exercise of any capability or art, a previous training and habituation are required. Therefore, for the practice of virtue. So practicing a virtue like courage or temperance or justice or even wisdom requires training and habituation and the, its actions are like with any art, like with architecture, for example, or painting, where you need training and habituation. The second premise is that the whole city has one end, and as we've seen, that end is a certain kind of virtue. Well, if you combine both of those premises, then third, it is manifest that education should be one and the same for all, and that it should be public. And fourth, he specifically says, and it shouldn't be private. It shouldn't be as at present, when everyone looks after his own children separately and gives them separate instruction of the sort which he thinks best. The training in things which are of common interest should be the same for all. So it's crucial that the city has exactly one end and it needs to bring that end about. And since all of the citizens are just parts of that one city, then all of them will need to be educated towards that one end. And so strongly does he believe this that he goes so far as to say, quote, neither must we suppose that any one of the citizens belongs to himself, for they all belong to the state, and are each of them a part of the state, and the care of each part is inseparable from the care of the whole.
Now, as Aristotle says in chapter two, there is widespread disagreement about both the ends and the means of education. Having concluded that, as he says, education should be regulated by law and should be an affair of the state, in fact, it should be public and the same for all, he next announces the topic, what should be the character of this public education? Now, there is widespread disagreement about the end of education, even if we agree that it's for the sake of the good life or happiness, some think that education should be for the sake of utility, for example, making jobs or money. Others think it should be for the sake of virtue. Among those who agree that it's for the sake of virtue, there may still be a disagreement about what kind of virtue, courage and glory in war, self-control and justice, or intellectual virtues like science or wisdom. And there is also widespread disagreement even among those who agree about the end, what are the best means to educating for that end? And that is because they disagree about the nature of virtue, and so how it can be produced and inculcated in individual citizens. Now, Aristotle distinguishes between what we now call education and job training. And the way he distinguishes this is a discussion of liberal and illiberal occupations. So he begins by saying that all have to agree that all citizens should be taught those things that are useful, which are also really necessary. So nobody could disagree with that. If they're necessary and useful, of course they should be taught. But Aristotle argues, not everyone should be taught all useful things. This is because some useful things are produced by liberal, illiberal, or unfree occupations. Learning these kinds of useful things would vulgarize the students. So some useful things, he says, shouldn't be taught to free people at all. Quote, and any occupation, art, or science which makes the body or soul or mind of the freeman less fit for the practice or exercise of virtue is vulgar. Wherefore, we call those arts vulgar which tend to deform the body and likewise, all paid jobs, for they absorb and degrade the mind. Let that sink in. Aristotle says, all paid jobs absorb and degrade the mind. So his ideal is that the happy citizens should not have paid jobs, should not have to work paid jobs. If you're someone who has to work a paid job, you're in an unfortunate situation in which at least your mind and your virtue will be uh, stunted and possibly corrupted, but also your body could be affected by it. And so even though those, those occupations that require those kinds of things are useful, they shouldn't be taught to free people. Other useful things have both liberal and illiberal aspects. These sub subjects should be taught, but only to a certain extent, because if one attends to them too closely in order to pertain, attain perfection in them, the same evil will follow, as in the case of the entirely illiberal occupations. The criterion Aristotle offers to distinguish whether an occupation is liberal or illiberal is whether the activity is done for its own sake and that of one's friends, or if it's done for the sake of others. Quote, the object also which a man sets before him makes a great difference. If he does or learns anything for his own sake or the sake of his friends, or with a view to excellence, the action will not appear illiberal. But if it is done for the sake of others, the very same action will be thought menial and servile. So on this view, work done for a corporation for a wage, for example, would be considered menial and servile, while the same activity undertaken for one's own ends would be considered free. So compare the contemporary distinction between training and education. Training, like job training, prepares the mind or the body to be useful for someone else's purpose someone else's making profit, for example. Education, on the other hand, prepares the mind to be useful for one's own purposes and to deliberate about those purposes. Totally different things, 
education and training, although nowadays the distinction is often overlooked. In the third chapter, Aristotle discusses the customary branches of education, which are first reading, writing, and drawing, which are regarded as useful for the purposes of life in a variety of ways. Aristotle doesn't say much about these here. He is especially interested in the ways that they're valuable without being useful. For example, he says that children may be taught drawing not to prevent their making mistakes in their own purchases, or in order that they may not be imposed upon in the buying or selling of articles, but perhaps rather because it makes them judges of the beauty of the human form. To be always seeking after the useful does not become free and exalted souls. Now, in addition to reading, writing, and drawing, Aristotle discusses gymnastic exercises, which are thought to infuse courage. He believes that, and so he thinks that those will be clearly a part of the main educational system, and he discusses them in the next chapter four. Finally, music. Now, although the core idea of music relates to harmonies, melodies, and rhythms that are sung or played on instruments, the Greek term actually means something much wider, perhaps even encompassing all of culture itself. And this is because Greek poetry, including epic and lyric poetry, and drama, like tragedy and comedy, was always accompanied by music in the core sense. And as he discusses in the poetics, dancing is another closely related phenomenon to this. Aristotle discusses musical education for the remainder of this chapter and in chapters five to seven. Now, the rest of chapter three, Aristotle discusses leisure, amusement, and pleasure. He raises a doubt about music, Concerning music, a doubt may be raised. In our own day, most men cultivate it for the sake of pleasure, but originally it was included in education because nature herself, as has often been said, requires that we should be able not only to work well, but to use leisure well. For, as I must repeat once again, the first principle of all action is leisure. Both are required, but leisure is better than occupation and is its end, and therefore the question must be asked, what ought we to do when at leisure? So in Book 7, we saw Aristotle argue that just as the end of war is peace, so the end of toil and work is to have leisure, but what do we do once we attain leisure? Well, one thing we do is listen to music, and this is one reason why music is very important. But its purpose is not mere amusement. Aristotle says, quote, clearly we ought not to be amusing ourselves, for then amusement would be the end of life. But if this is inconceivable, and amusement is needed more amid serious occupations than at other times, for he who is hard at work has need of relaxation, and amusement gives relaxation, whereas occupation is always accompanied with exertion and effort, we should introduce amusements only at suitable times, and they should be our medicines, for the emotion which they create in the soul is a relaxation, and from the pleasure we obtain rest. But leisure itself gives pleasure and happiness and enjoyment of life, which are experienced not by the busy man, but by those who have leisure, for he who is occupied has in view some end which he has not attained, but happiness is an end, since all men deem it to be accompanied with pleasure and not with pain. So it's quite serious business, this relaxation and pleasure that we derive from music. It allows us to pursue greater unleisured things, toil and war and that sort of thing, as their end. They enable those other important things uh, in order to bring them about. But different kinds of pleasure, Aristotle argues, are enjoyed by different kinds of people. And this varies according to their habits. Of course, the pleasure of the best man will be the best and spring from the noblest sources. But it's clear, he says, then that there are branches of learning and education which we must study merely with a view to leisure spent in intellectual activity. And these are to be valued for their own sake, 
whereas those kinds of knowledge which are useful in business are to be deemed merely necessary and exist for the sake of other things. Now, why was music introduced into education in the first place? Even if it has those kinds of ends, why was it introduced into education? I mean, music is neither necessary the way the other customary branches are or any other facet of education you can think of. So reading and writing are useful in money making, in the management of a household, in the acquisition of knowledge in the political life, and drawing is useful for a more correct judgment of the works of artists, and gymnastics is useful because it gives health and strength and courage and so forth, but music doesn't seem to do any of those things. What remains is the idea that the use of music for intellectual enjoyment of, in leisure, which is in fact evidently the reason for its introduction, this being one of the ways in which it is thought that a freeman should pass his leisure. So it was originally introduced in order to make sure that leisure time was enjoyable and was credibly enjoyable, engaged in something that is um, intellectually stimulating. It is therefore evident then, he says, that there is a sort of education in which parents should train their sons, not as being useful or necessary, but because it is liberal or noble. So Aristotle actually removes in part. He goes so far with this argument as to remove the idea that music is useful. It's, it's merely a final end, and that, that seems to be his account of the original idea why it was introduced, is only for the sake of its ends. Now, there are still outstanding issues like what kinds of musical education are there and which should be taught to whom, and so Aristotle will pick these issues up again in chapter 5. Before then, however, in chapter 4, he discusses the purpose of gymnastic education. So Aristotle holds that the body develops before the mind, and therefore the body should be trained before the mind. He recommends that boys should be trained in both gymnastics and wrestling, and this is kind of a scheme for physical education. He criticizes the Spartan educational system because, quote, they brutalize their children by laborious exercises, which they think will make them courageous, end quote. They treat this as the ultimate end of all education, but Aristotle does not think education should be primarily directed at cultivating this specific virtue. In fact, he thinks it should be aimed at cultivating other virtues, more intellectual virtues. Now, he points out that even wild animals and savage barbarians, it turns out, can outdo even those who have been trained in the Spartan way at brutality and courage understood in terms of that kind of violent activity. And Aristotle attributes the Spartan success not to the superiority of their educational system, but to the fact that they trained systematically at war when their rivals did not. Now, in obsessively focusing on this kind of training, Spartans in fact vulgarized their citizens and their children making them capable of engaging only in the kind of politics which is directly related to war. The fact that they have rivals even in this area now, at the time Aristotle's writing, shows the worthlessness of their overall education system, which does nothing to show them, for example, how to enjoy leisure, which is more an end of education and of the state than is war. So Aristotle argues and warns against this kind of excessive gymnastic training. And he compares it to athletic training, which involves severe dieting and painful toll, which he thinks can impair the growth of the body. And he proves this by pointing to Olympic victors. He says, not more than two or three of them have gained a prize as boys and as men. Their early training in severe gymnastic exercises exhausted their constitutions. Can see a similar thing in people who complain about the overemphasis of athletics, say in high schools, uh, where not more than two of three of them are going to go on to become professional uh, athletes, but the um, intensive training may inhibit their uh, mental development in other ways and may exhaust their constitutions. 
Aristotle oddly claims that physical and mental activity should occur in discrete periods of life. Quote, men ought not to labor at the same time with their minds and with their bodies, for the two kinds of labor are opposed to one another. The labor of the body impedes the mind, and the labor of the mind the body. Now, turning from gymnastics, then, which he thinks has an important role but should be strictly limited, now Aristotle turns to musical education. What is the purpose of musical education nowadays? Earlier he discussed why it was originally introduced, purely for this intellectual stimulation in leisure, but he now says that it's not easy to determine the nature of music and why anyone should have a knowledge of it. So here he considers three possible reasons why musical education might be cultivated. One, for amusement. For the sake of amusement and relaxation like sleep or drinking, which are not good in themselves but are pleasant. So music would then be like sleeping, drinking, and dancing, which are pleasurable activities we engage in but really aren't their own um, ends. Second, uh, musical education could be for the sake of virtue, and this he actually uh, describes as being for the sake of education. So music conduces to virtue on the grounds that it can form our minds and habituate us to true pleasures as our bodies are made to be gymnastic, to be of a certain character. Music would thus be like gymnastics, but instead of improving the body, it would improve the mind. And the third possibility, which he distinguishes both from cultivation of virtue and from amusement, he says it, musical education could be for intellectual enjoyment of leisure and mental cultivation. Now, although Aristotle thinks that all three of these are in fact valid reasons to support musical education, he thinks the first and third can be ruled out in the case of youth education. The amusement factor can be ruled out because as he quite sternly says, learning is no amusement, but is accompanied with pain. And the uh, idea of intellectual enjoyment can be ruled out because youths are too imperfect with respect to their intellect, and they can't attain the end of intellectual enjoyment yet. So the answer of why introduce musical education into primary education nowadays seems to be that it should be cultivated for the sake of virtue. But if it is just being cultivated for the sake of virtue, why teach musical performance and not just musical appreciation? This is the next subject that Aristotle takes up. Why should children be taught to perform like singing and playing instruments instead of just hearing others play music? Aristotle mentions that Persians and Medians are educated in musical appreciation by listening to others perform. Similarly, the Spartans, without learning music, nevertheless claim to be able to correctly judge, as they say, good and bad melodies. The problem is that musical performance is dangerously close to manual labor. For this reason, the gods, like Zeus, are never depicted as singing or playing the lyre. Professional musicians are considered by Aristotle and people of his class to be vulgar. And Aristotle says that, quote, no freeman would play or sing unless he were intoxicated or in jest. So the answer to this problem, why should we teach musical performance? Can't we get these virtuous benefits of music by just teaching people how to appreciate music without getting their hands dirty, actually playing or singing themselves, the answer to this will come after an account of how musical training serves the ends of amusement and intellectual enjoyment as well as education, i.e. inculcation of virtue. So music, amusement, pleasure, and intellectual enjoyment. Aristotle says that amusement is for the sake of relaxation, and relaxation is of necessity sweet, for it is the remedy of pain caused by toil, and intellectual enjoyment is universally acknowledged to contain an element not only of the noble, but of the pleasant, for happiness is made up of both. And all agree that music is one of the most pleasant things. This is why it is present at social gatherings and entertainments because it makes the hearts of men glad. So on this ground alone, Aristotle says, we may assume that the youth ought to be trained in music. 
For innocent pleasures are not only in harmony with the perfect end of life, but they also provide relaxation. And whereas men rarely attain the end, but often rest by the way and amuse themselves, not only with a view to a further end, but also for the pleasure's sake, it may be well at times to let them find a refreshment in music. But Aristotle next warns against taking this kind of amusement as the final end, and he says some people get confused about this and think that all I need to do is promote a kind of lifestyle so that I can have as much amusement as possible. He doesn't think that's right, he doesn't think that's virtuous, he doesn't think that results in the good life, but he does concede that this amusement, enjoyment, and pleasure, especially an intellectual kind of pleasure taken in the appreciation of music, is worthwhile and, and the citizen should be educated for it. The more important reason is the effect of music on character and virtue. The fact that music produces pleasure for all indicates that it has a kind of natural effect. Quote, the pleasure given by music is natural and therefore adapted to all ages and characters, end of quote. This suggests to Aristotle that music might have some influence over the character and the soul because it's tied in with uh, the natural aspects of the character and the soul. In fact, he says, it must have such an influence if characters are affected by it. And it's clear that they are affected by it. That they are so affected is proved in many ways, not least by the power which the songs of Olympus exercise, for beyond question they inspire enthusiasm, and enthusiasm is an emotion of the ethical part of the soul. So he's referring to a specific musician, Olympus, whose compositions were widespread. Plato and other people point out that they are capable of inspiring and making people enthusiastic and have this direct effect on the emotion of the soul. We can think of the effects on emotion of other kinds of music uh, that we listen to, for example, jazz music or rap or something like that, which affects our emotions and our enthusiasm. In general, he says, when men hear imitations, even apart from the rhythms and tunes themselves, their feelings move in sympathy. Since then music is a pleasure, and virtue consists in rejoicing and loving and hating aright, there is clearly nothing which we are so much concerned to acquire and to cultivate as the power of forming right judgments and of taking delight in good dispositions and noble actions. So, in this sense, given that it has such an important effect on character, and that's the main thing we're concerned about, there's almost nothing that we're more concerned to discuss. And this is because music has this power of imitation, of um, representing character, and also accompanies other representations of character, for example, in dramas or in poetry. And Aristotle says that rhythm and melody themselves supply imitations of emotions like anger and gentleness, but also courage and temperance and of all the qualities contrary to these, and of the other qualities of character, which hardly fall short of the actual affections, as we know from our own experience. For in listening to such strains, our souls undergo a change. So Aristotle argues that music can have a profound impact on character and thus virtue. He says that even in mere melodies, there's an imitation of character, for the musical modes differ essentially from one another, and those who hear them are differently affected by each. Now this term mode, musical mode, we use the Latin term mode to translate the Greek term harmonia, literally harmony, but technically we are referring to a specific type of musical scale that has certain harmonic and melodic characteristics. The name of the music modes refer vaguely to regions from which they supposedly originate, referring to detailed treatments of the subject by philosophers writing about music, Aristotle descri describes the affects of the various modes as follows. The mixolydian, he says, makes men sad and grave. The relaxed modes enfeeble the mind. The Dorian mode produces a moderate and settled temper, and the Phrygian mode inspires enthusiasm. Aristotle says, that similar principles apply to different kinds of rhythm, 
Some of them have a character of rest, others of motion, and of these latter, again, some have a more vulgar, others a nobler movement. And he concludes, enough has been shown, has been said to show that music has a power of forming the character and should therefore be introduced into the education of the young. But again, the question, admitting that music should be introduced to the education of the young, should children be taught to sing and play? So should the education be in performance or appreciation? Well, the reason to teach them to play is because it's difficult, if not impossible, for those who do not perform to be good judges of the, of the performance of others. We conclude that they should be taught music in such a way as to become not only critics, but also performers. Now, the responses to the objection that musical performance is a kind of manual labor, and so practicing music will make the students vulgar, Aristotle concedes that, quote, it is quite possible that certain methods of teaching and learning music do really do have a degrading effect. But two things he says can mitigate this danger. First, they can be taught to play when very young, just enough to gain the ability to appreciate and criticize musical playing of others, but then relieved from practicing musical instruments or singing when they're older. Quote, the right measure will be attained if students of music stop short of the arts which are practiced in professional contests and do not seek to acquire those fantastic marvels of execution which are now the fashion in such contests and from these have passed into education." End of quote. The second way to counteract the vulgarizing effect of music is to limit the kinds of music that are played, so employing only the noble melodies, rhythms, and instruments when training them to play, as opposed to that so-called common part of music in which Aristotle says, every slave or child and even some animals find pleasure. In particular, Aristotle goes on to give a diatribe against employing flute playing in education. Now, the last major point to be discussed is the political use of these different kinds of music. So Aristotle says, now we see that music is produced by melody and rhythm, and we ought to know what influence these have respectively on education, and whether we should prefer excellence in melody or excellence in rhythm. But as the subject has been very well treated by many musicians of the present day, and also by philosophers who have had considerable experience of musical education, to these we would refer the more exact student of the subject. We shall only speak of it now after the manner of the legislator, stating the general principles. So this is the politics of music. This is music insofar as it concerns the politician and the legislator. Now, for that person has to recognize that different modes, uh, different kinds of harmony will be appropriate to different ends. Again, we've already said many times that music has several possible benefits, education, i.e. inculcating virtue, enjoyment, relaxation, and recreation. Aristotle also mentions here purgation or catharsis, but he doesn't explain the term. Instead, he promises to explain it in another work called the Poetics, but although he employs the term there, he doesn't explain it. Accordingly, this is one of the most controversial concepts in Aristotle's philosophy and specifically his aesthetics. But here is what he says about the other effects of the modes. First, relaxed modes, such as the Lydian, should be employed contrary to what Plato says. The fact that they produce gentler melodies is useful for the enjoyment and relaxation of the elderly. But Aristotle also says that such relaxed modes could be useful for entertaining the working class. So he says that there should, quote, be contests and exhibitions instituted for the relaxation of even a vulgar crowd composed of mechanics, laborers, and the like. Now, because their minds are perverted from the natural state, they enjoy what he calls perverted modes and highly strung and unnaturally colored melodies, unquote. In general, 
uh, the those who are in the process of being educated and those who are already educated should avoid both performing and listening to such music, but it still has its purposes within the city. Now, the so-called modes of passion may be admitted when we're listening to the performance of others. The uh, these refer to modes that have strong effects on those souls who are prone to strong feelings like pity or fear, and they affect them like the way sacred melodies affect people they throw into religious frenzy, who Aristotle says are thus, quote, restored as though they had found healing and purgation. Such people can have their emotions purged by listening to music in such modes so that their souls are lightened and delighted and the modes affecting them are thus sometimes called purgative melodies which give an innocent pleasure not just to people who are especially emotional but to all of mankind finally the modes of action or ethical modes are what should be employed in education, that is, in the inculcation of virtue. So Aristotle criticizes Plato for allowing only the Phrygian mode, arguing that, in fact, the Phrygian mode is not a, really an ethical mode, but more of a passionate mode. He prefers the Dorian mode, saying, quote, whereas we say that the extreme should be avoided and the mean followed, and whereas the Dorian is a mean between the other modes, it is evident that our youth should be taught the Dorian music. So this is a lot like the way we still uh, prescribe and prescribe what kinds of music the youth should listen to because we think that it has an impact on their education and in fact on their souls and character. So that's all Aristotle says about education in Book 8. It's not clear whether Book 8 is complete and thus whether the politics itself is complete. One may have expected more discussion of education, for example, more on reading, writing, and drawing, or on the other areas of training or education, whether required by the state or even by philosophy. What does Aristotle think of what we would call higher education, for example? Here I'll just make a couple of brief comments by way of conclusion. First, it's clear from Book 7, Chapter 2, and many other texts that Aristotle thinks the state should support such philosophical activity as an end of the state, perhaps as the ultimate and highest end, certainly the end of the best state. And the institutions of the best state, which are discussed in Book 7 to 8, are all structured in order to bring it about that philosophical activity and even a philosophical way of life is possible, at least for a few wise men. The other virtues, such as courage and temperance, and even other intellectual virtues, are available to all of the citizens, and the other benefits of civic and political life are available to all the other inhabitants of the city or the state. But in what remains of the politics, Aristotle does not discuss how direct or indirect the state support for or intervention in philosophical activity should be. Aristotle does not discuss higher education, for example, in mathematics, natural science, or philosophy generally. He doesn't even discuss education in ethics and politics so that it's not clear exactly how, other than by employing certain musical modes, the citizens are to be inculcated with courage, temperance, and justice. Now there's some irony here because works like the Nicomachean Ethics and the Politics are themselves apparently artifacts of some kind of higher education in philosophy, something like a record of Aristotle's lectures on the topic, perhaps his own notes, or the notes of one of his students or of some group of students. It's possible that Aristotle imagined that philosophical schools would be entirely private concerns. Plato's Academy, after all, was not a public institution, even though the Republic calls for, revolutionarily, public higher education. 
So Aristotle might have thought that that kind of education is not a subject of politics. It's not something relevant to the common good of the entire political community, but it is the end of those political communities in the sense that he wants to bring about a situation where at least some people can engage in that kind of philosophical activity, even apart from other political institutions, and still be happy. That's what happens in his best state.